Would you like to take a ride? Huh. A humanoid robot that changes into a vehicle. I wonder if there's a Hasbro property like that. Oh, right, of course. Transmutation formers. Transmutation formers. More new items available. Super fire blast. Welcome, my friends, to Power Rangers Beast Morphers. Go, go! Here we are again, my friends. In the year of our Lord 2021, we have ourselves another history of Power Rangers and a new era for the show, the first effort of Hasbro's stewardship of the series. I tell you that they certainly haven't skimped on the toy side of things. The Lightning Collection has a cool range of stuff, especially in the figures department. I tend to prefer the roleplay stuff like morphers and weapons, but I know people who have been pretty happy with the selection of figures put out. But we're not here to talk about the toys, we're here to talk about the show itself. Hasbro, as most people are probably aware, is not really known for live-action properties. Oh sure, you've got stuff like the Transformers movies, but let's be real here. Most of that kind of thing is overseen by movie studios, not the toy company that owns the rights to it. No, when it comes to Hasbro's television works, it's usually animation, with products like G.I. Joe, Transformers, My Little Pony, etc. But hey, it's not like Power Rangers would be Hasbro's first live-action TV series. Why, for the Channel Hub, they produced... Uh, Taylor Swift, Journey to Fearless, and, um, Hub World, a news magazine show mostly existing as a promotional vehicle for programs on the Hub. Well, well okay, they did a six-part adaptation of the board game Clue, and the old movie version of that remains wonderful, and, uh, <laughs> it's, uh... I'm not a yo. I'm an Agnes. DJ Jazzy Jack spinning a surprise set? Gotta get the word out! Okay, we may be in trouble. I kid a bit. People were telling me all the time it was airing that Beast Morphers is actually really good. And despite the changing of hands in production, a lot of staffers remained on, including Judd Lynn basically staying in his position overseeing the series after Ninja Steel, which I think was a good call. Keep the people who know what they're doing to help with the transition. And hey, as a result of a shift in oversight, suddenly, from a creative perspective, the new bosses might be more amenable to fresh creative ideas than the old ones. Were there new ideas? Or was this just more of the same? Well, let's find out. The series begins with Beasts Unleashed. Strangely, and what I think is a first for the show, unless the version I'm watching is different from the broadcast version, or I'm remembering wrong, I have been making these videos for over 10 years now, the episode actually immediately begins with the post theme song credits and episode title. In fact, the theme song is until almost eight minutes in, more than a third of the way through the episode. By that point, people would have forgotten the show's supposed to have it. Hell, this is actually a recurring problem for the show, with the theme song and first commercial break not occurring until a good chunk of the episode is already over, even though episodes seem like they're still structured to have a cold open that leads into it. Anyway, we open in the town of Coral Harbor, where they apparently realized at some point, wait a second, the morphing grid is supposed to be this huge source of power, right? Why don't we tap that thing for clean energy? They're minutes away from switching the towers on and using Morph X energy to hopefully end pollution in the world. We cut over to Riptide Gym, where I guess the Cobra Kai's are training, as the teacher of a karate class, Blaze, is annoyed that one of his students, Devin, wants to learn more challenging moves. And his reaction is to attack Devin. Devin manages to defeat him, but Devin's father, the mayor, shows up to pull him out of class. Thanks for the lesson, please. This isn't over. Nothing shows you have the patience and knowledge to teach karate than being a petulant, violent jackass. Mayor Daniels is annoyed that his son spends all his time playing PS Vita and learning karate instead of getting a job. But you're an expert at video games and karate. Son, those aren't gonna take you anywhere. I don't know, karate led Tommy to like three or so career paths. They're heading to Grid Battle Force Headquarters, where they're gonna be tapping into the morphing grid. Devin wants to go in because the place has an amazing, supposedly unbeatable battle simulator, but his dad doesn't want him anywhere near it. He actually thinks the idea of tapping into the morphing grid is dangerous and stupid. Damn politicians standing in the way of clean energy. I bet he's in the pocket of big psycho rangers. Devin, however, decides to sneak in by using his phone to take a photo of his security badge. But hey, it's not like that'll work. This is the source of power, not only to all Power Rangers, but soon the entire city. They're gonna have better security than just a badge reader. That looks a lot like you. It is me. Well, we'll see about that. 
Okay, weird that she doesn't know what the mayor looks like, but the other security guard will confirm with a retinal scan, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> Coral Bay is gonna be the next Chernobyl, isn't it? But hey, at least they are doing security checks while not watching the front or having any other guards at the entrance, which allows Devin to sneak in and indeed use his phone to bypass security. Another person identifies that the mayor is, in fact, the mayor. Huh? The mayor? Yeah, it says so on that pass you were looking at. These are Ben and Betty, siblings, and also... Uh, our comic relief duo for the season. <sighs> I miss Victor Vincent already. Anyway, the person who identified the mayor, Zoe, escorts him through. Zoe works in laundry, a washout from the Battle Force Academy, but she still hopes to make a difference. Commander Shaw, who's in charge of Battle Force, gives the mayor a tour, starting with the laboratory. Nate Silva, the chief scientist, is a child prodigy who's been working at the place since he was six, and he explains that he found a way to refine energy from the morphing grid into this Gatorade right here. Hence, more facts. The mayor explains his concerns, that every villain in every dimension, name-dropping Rita, Galvanax, and Sledge, has tried to steal the power of the Rangers to rule the universe. And now that you've wrapped it up with a ribbon, some evil mind will try to take it again. As Devin disguises himself as a scientist and is stopped by someone, we finally get our theme song. I don't like it. While it does contain Go-Go Power Rangers, usually something I enjoy, the song just feels so lifeless. It's a bunch of techno beats, a little guitar, not really a tune, some synthesized voice. It sounds generic, like a throwback to an early 2000s action cartoon. Probably something CGI, like a spy thing. It's just not good. Go -Go! Some blame this on Nickelodeon insisting on 30-second theme songs. Even if it is an edict from Nick, I object to that being the problem because plenty of other shows can make 30-second theme songs work. Hell, during the later days of Zeo, the theme song there got shortened to 30 seconds. It shouldn't make a difference as long as the song is good and made for it. What's weird is that the actual music during fights is okay, with once again using shades of Go-Go Power Rangers as its primary leitmotif, but otherwise doesn't sound like the theme song in any way. Anyway, the guy just stopped Devin because he was going to the wrong place with his cart there. They go to the morphing lab, where the mayor is also being sent to. The commander wants to assuage his concerns by showing off that they've developed their own Power Rangers. The Morphex will flow from here, where it will combine with animal DNA. Then it'll flow into our three subjects, mutating their DNA. Oh, good! It's been a while since Power Rangers decided to do some genetic manipulation. I look forward to seeing how many Cronenbergs this results in. The mutation should work perfectly with teenagers. Oh, great, great, great! Heaven forbid we use adults in this job! See, I give a pass to stuff like Zordon, or hell, even Gosei for this sort of thing, because they're big, mystical figures who probably can sense who is the best of the best for this sort of thing, the ones who have the right mental and physical makeup to make these sorts of decisions in a way that a normal human can't understand. I really wince when it's other humans, especially ones with government funding, deciding, yeah, let's weaponize teenagers. Screw Cronenbergs, this is gonna be an Evangelion situation waiting to happen. Get in the Megazord, Shinji! Anyway, while Nate is showing off the Beast Morphers tech, Devin notices some kind of weird purple energy crossing through a computer monitor and down into some of the Mountain Dew full of morphing grid energy. It dissipates, though. The mayor is also told that for security reasons, they can't reveal the identities of the three rangers. But, of course, when he leaves, we, and Devin, see that it's Blaze and two others who had been at the gym. Devin is found out when he sees some kind of snake creature inside of the grid energy. He warns them about what he saw, some kind of computer virus, but they detect nothing wrong. Still, Commander Shaw is not stupid, and while they hold Devin in a cell, she orders Nate to run a full check on the systems regardless. The other two rangers are Roxy and Ravi, who aren't siblings like the similar names would suggest, which is good because the two used to date. But now that they're rangers, the rules state that they can't be together, much to Roxy in particular's disappointment. Nate doesn't detect anything, so the countdown to activation of the towers continues. The ceremony is completed, and energy begins to flow, teenager DNA gets manipulated, and... Wait. The system's detecting a foreign virus. I am Evox. 
Yeah, I could have told you this was a mistake to play with morphin energy like this. After all, too much pink energy is dangerous. They try to abort the sequence and get everyone to evacuate, but the place is going wild. Even the holding cell doors malfunction, allowing Devin to escape. Zoe is told to leave too, but she decides not to. I saw a big problem. Laundry girl to the rescue! We solve problems too! No, we don't! Maybe you're in the wrong careers. Anyway, they can't stop the power infusion of the Rangers, but fortunately, Roxy and Blaze are not turned evil. Exactly. Rather, their bodies get knocked unconscious, and evil duplicates of them, called avatars, emerge in their place. Devin grabs a gun and shoots the tube carrying Morphin Energy in, stopping it before Ravi is changed too. Devin, Zoe, and Ravi are forced back into the Morphin Converter, and with no other choice, Nate quickly transforms them into rangers to stop the avatars. Devin has cheetah DNA now, although considering this flying kick he made in civilian form, I'm not sure anything really changed. Zoe, jackrabbit DNA, and Ravi, a gorilla. Nate uses the teleportation devices they've developed to beam the avatars as far away from the base as possible. Which seems like a bit of a mistake, since that means they're now on the loose where they can attack civilians rather than being contained inside, but hey, I'm not a child prodigy. Actually, he'll later explain that the avatars were sent to a different dimension. Roxy and Blaze are in comas. Their bodies perfectly healthy, but their minds are elsewhere. They're linked through the morphing grid, Nate theorizing that if they destroy the avatars, their minds will be returned to their bodies. They're intelligent. They'll find a way back here. Especially if the place they're in has an interdimensional subway train. Shaw says that they'll need the Power Rangers to defend them if and when the avatars return, in the process revealing that Ravi is her son. They have a lot of training to get caught up on, so the two are sent to the battle simulator to end the first episode. Our second episode, Evox's Revenge, sees the avatars landing in human form in what looks like the netherworld. Hey, if you see Octoroo hanging out in the Senzu River, tell him it's not too late to finally do that samurai follow-up. Actually, they landed in the cyber dimension, which means I guess we finally have that Power Rangers and Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad crossover that we always wanted. And remember that if my Patreon gets high enough, I'll cover that show as part of History of Power Rangers too, just so it doesn't take two years in between new HOPR videos. Hmm? That was a shameless plug? Yes, I know. Anyway, the two meet Scrozzel, who currently rules this realm with the foot soldiers of the season, Tronix, who are all quickly zapped by Evox. It's here where we lay down the specifics. Evox is trapped in the cyber dimension and wants into our dimension. Morphex energy could definitely teleport him out, but his own power is so great that they need a lot of it to teleport him between dimensions. The small amount they have can send Tronix and Avatars through, though, so they'll be heading out to try to retrieve more. Back with the Rangers, they're introduced to the Beast Bots, robot helpers that have animal DNA in them, Although what that means is never explained. They have organic bits fused to the tech inside them? And suddenly I'm fearing we're gonna have a Wii 3 situation in here. They all have their own personalities and names. Jax, Smash, and Cruz. The three can transform into weapons for them to use, as you saw at the start with Cruz turning into a motorcycle. And in fact, their Zords later on we'll see have multiple modes that they can transform into. I wonder if that transformation aspect was what caused Hasbro to elect to do this series instead of proceeding on with another one. In addition, they'll become the control consoles of their Zords. And of course, Cruise is our season requisite role for Kelson Henderson, just voiced this time. Back in the digital world, Scrozzle explains that he's hiding out here from a villain called Vargoyle, who is a lot more powerful and a lot less helpful to them. He built the Tronics to protect himself from them. They head back to Earth to steal energy, leading to a fight with the Rangers. The Tronics are okay foot soldiers. The pink slash magenta color scheme is kind of unique, and they've got kind of weird armor over their shoulders and chests. The helmets are neat, though it's hard to glimpse details of them. A single eye, almost like a thin visor, a misshapen slit mouth, and a big red dot above their visor. Something about the red dot above there seems familiar. Despite being robotic, though, they just kind of make weird noises, almost like squawking. <laughs> Monsters are created by using copies of the Evox virus infused with Morphex energy and inserting a morphing key into an object, transforming it into a monster called a Robotron. It's kind of reminiscent of Lord Zed changing everyday objects into monsters. Except this time, when they're destroyed, they're destroyed. So at this point I should talk about the suits. 
They are unlike anything we've ever seen before in Power Rangers, a fact I pointed out years ago when I thought this Sentai, Go Busters, would never get adapted. Instead of the traditional spandex... That is not spandex! The material is a self-assembling metal! It's kind of a leather jacket and pants, with a helmet that resembles the respective animal, and a larger-than-normal mouthplate. They look like the most practical and functional suits we've ever had on the show, which makes sense given this is another government-run, or at least privately funded with government-subsidized, ranger team. I like them. They're simple designs, but different because of the new material. The morphing sequence is actually kind of lame. We don't see it properly until the third episode, and it's just them being surrounded by CGI smoke and animal head, then their helmets form up once the CGI smoke clears. The only cool part is that their visors come out of the morpher and form into the helmet. Speaking of, I loved the morphers. They're kind of a combination of everything I like in a morpher. It's wrist-based, it opens up, it uses a secondary device, a key in this case a la Turbo. It's a unique design, and it's not a cell phone. The Morphex Energy stolen isn't enough to get Evox out, but it is enough for Scrozzle to unleash a Giga Drone, basically blank slate giant robots that take on the partial form of a Robotron, but giant sized. The Zords this time around are vehicles again, as befits this type of organized ranger team, though the individual Zords have an alternate mode that reflects their animal. What does not befit them is that we learn the Evox virus did get into enough of the transferred DNA to corrupt them partially. No Cronenbergs, but they all have weaknesses based on their animals. If Devin sees a dog, he freezes up. Zoe consumes energy more rapidly and needs to eat carrots to replenish herself. Ravi overheats easily and becomes more aggressive. None of this makes the slightest bit of sense unless your understanding of animals does not go past the first grade, which... You know, certainly possible when their chief scientist isn't old enough to drive. Cheetahs are cats, and cats are afraid of dogs, so Devin freezes up when seeing a dog! Far too complex for you to understand. The carrot one is especially terrible, because while rabbits can eat carrots, they're actually not that good for them in excess, and particularly not a jackrabbit like Joey is, since carrots contain a lot more sugar than you would imagine. Too many carrots causes diabetes in rabbits. And Ravi's thing is about... Uh, gorillas getting too hot? I don't know, it's dumb. Though these weaknesses do come up again a few times throughout the series, usually for comic relief. Devin is given leadership of the team, and while at first it's odd that the least experienced would be given the role, the show demonstrates quite nicely that he actually has leadership qualities. Patience, concern for his teammates, the ability to prop up all parts of it, bravery, etc. It helps that the other two spend the entirety of the episode bickering over it. What I'm confused by is why they're not making more rangers. It's not like the equipment to make more rangers was utterly destroyed, and there must have been a backup team being trained in the event that something happened to the main three before they got their powers, or having somebody on standby. Hell, the entire premise of the season is predicated on having direct access to the morphing grid and using it for power. The sentiment still rings true, even if it's not about money in this case. You're rich, buy an army. Despite the goofiness of the animal DNA weaknesses thing, the first two episodes are a very strong start to the season. The premise already establishes ties to the larger Power Rangers universe, and while it's implied that this is the main timeline thanks to the particular villain's name dropped, because of the mayor stating interdimensional threats, this could be its own continuity altogether. Just one more aware of the other threats faced by Rangers. It's just, as I said last time, Wes going around giving interdimensional transporters to everyone out there means that other dimensions now know about rangers, the morphing grid, and threats out there. Although it's suggested later that this universe didn't have rangers before making contact with other universes, so it's odd that Wes would just randomly drop one off if they didn't. The team dynamics gel right away, with hints of SPD both with the larger organization and with a blue ranger training to be on the team and acting as the most experienced. But also that misfit quality by having people who may not be the best, but certainly deserve to wear the suits. We also got some cool new dynamics right off the bat. SPD had evil rangers at the end of the show, but this one gives us evil rangers to start with, and a strong motivation to fight them. Plus, they play with it in the fourth episode, A Digital Deception, when Avatar Roxy tries to trick Ravi into joining her by pretending she's overcoming the Evox virus in her, and playing on his sympathies and love. Speaking of the villains, we've got a lot of mystery and intrigue around them. Where did Evox come 
come from? What's his backstory? Who's Vargoyle and what's their agenda? Anyway, on the subject of villains, in the fourth episode, they retrieve a neural aligner that was originally used in turning Blaze and Roxy evil. Scrozzle hates the Avatars and wants the favor of Evox for himself, thus working on his own plans to push them out. Surprisingly, the series actually doesn't have our heroes form the Megazord right away, waiting until the sixth episode to do so. Instead, the initial Zords actually get some spotlight and cool moments in fights. And in fact, we have a lot more instances of this show using the individual Zords to fight threats instead of just always forming the Megazord. What's more, because the Gigadrone is different from the Robotron, most of the time you have two fights happening simultaneously. One group fighting the Robotron on the ground, while another group is fighting the Gigadrones in their Zords. And thus we have the Beast X Megazord, which... I don't know, it looks really busy to me. Like, just too many details on it that keeps it from looking like a good hole altogether, even though it's only made of three zords. In the meantime, Scrozzle salvages a bunch of components to build a Cybergate, a method by which Evox can re-enter Earth. Man, I wonder if he'll be able to open it. Anyway, episode 8 is called The Cybergate Opens. Scrozzle starts building the Cybergate on Earth, but the problem is they need a robot body for Evox to inhabit, and it has to be pretty advanced and powerful to hold him. As such, they kidnap Nate, who normally has to have an escort when he leaves the base because of how essential he is to the Rangers' operations, to construct something for them. With the stolen tech available to him, Nate comes up with an alternate plan. Construct the robot, but instead it's actually a Ranger suit, which he quickly links to himself to become the Gold Mantis Ranger. I whipped up an antidote. It's based on praying mantis DNA. But weirdly, instead of grafting the suit onto him, it actually duplicated the suit? And like made a silver beetle ranger out of the robot body? Who programmed it? How does it have a personality already? It's got a very do-gooder, overly enthusiastic personality at that, plus some decent jokes. How are they beating us? With flair! The gold and silver rangers' outfits don't really differ that much from the main three, mostly just adding shoulder pads and a different jacket design. They look good, though it's odd that they're being introduced this early. Their morphers are described online as a cell phone, but if it is, it's one that can turn into a small gun. I dig it. So this new robot character is gonna need a name. How about Mr. Fantastic, Super Handsome, Strong as Steel? Nope, sorry, we'd shorten it to Mr. Fantastic, but Disney doesn't own Power Rangers anymore, and they might get upset, so we're going with Steel. They explain that he's actually a cyborg. The process didn't just put insect DNA into Nate and Steel, but also transferred some of Nate's own human DNA into him. This makes no sense, and yet it's working. God, between this and all the animal DNA they're throwing around everywhere, this this really will end like the Rick and Morty episode with everyone mutating into monstrous blobs. I'm not the one who, 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 who haphazardly, you know, mixed a bunch of nonsense together and created a bunch of Cronenbergs. Just watch, this whole thing is going to be another post-apocalyptic Power Rangers series like RPM. Hell, it even has a computer virus as the villain. It all matches. Here's what's crazier though. As Phantom Roxas on Twitter pointed out, Nate actually created a Beetleborg. However, it seems the Cybergate was not completely destroyed in the battle, so they're able to repair it and plan to take Steel's body for Evox, leading us into Silver Sacrifice. After a failed attempt to capture Steel, General Burke, the military representative on the base, as well as the father of Ben and Betty, wants him shut down for the safety of the planet. The Rangers instead elect to destroy the Cybergate to eliminate Evox's need for Steel. However, when they arrive to deal with the gate, Ben and Betty are captured, and Steel elects to sacrifice himself to save them, allowing Evox to take over his body. And right now, your family needs me. With my body, Evox will be strong, but I know you can destroy him. But it turns out that human DNA saves him. His body is no longer compatible with Evox, so they're able to destroy the gate and force Evox back into the cyber dimension. Anyway, in the ensuing fight, which destroys the cyber gate, we see the Scarab Zord and the Mantis Zord and... Uh... That is not a mantis. Yeah, in the original Sentai, both the gold and silver Go Busters were beetle-themed, just different kinds of beetles. According to Hasbro, the decision to change it up was for the sake of kids to make it easier for them to say and recognize the names. Because I guess kids can't distinguish two different kinds of beetles. But yeah, there you go. I guess it's just a Power Rangers tradition at this point to find one thing in the series they can call something it's not, even when it's blatantly obvious what it is. Still, their Zords combine together to form 
form the Striker Megazord, bringing our count up to two. Over the next several episodes, Blaze and Roxy compete to make copies of the Beast Morphers DNA enhancements given by their animal DNA. Gorilla Strength, Cheetah Speed, Jack Rapid Jumping, to try to be enhanced themselves by it. I should note that they keep throwing around this idea of DNA and robotic things, but never once did they ever say the word cyborg. Or if they did, I never noticed it. Even Steel is just described as half-human, even though they never show off what part of him is human. He doesn't even have a digestive system. He's powered by Morphex. Anyway, the villains only have a handful of data chips capable of copying the powers, thus only one of the two can get the enhancements. During this, we unveil what I guess we could consider Devon's Battleizer, Red Fury Mode. It's some light armor that flows pretty nicely with the regular outfit, some cool claws, one of the least bulky Battleizers ever, frankly. We also see that Nate and Zoe have crushes on each other, but with both as rangers, the no dating rule applies to them. One of the problems with the Red Fury Mode, however, is soon discovered. It's powered by by Fury Cells, evil objects from the cyber dimension that Scrozzle had. He uses them for powering up monsters, but there were only four of them. And using Fury Mode uses up the energy from them, but it also corrupts Devin and turns him evil. Pure evil? Pure evil. After he finally chooses not to use the final cell, which would have made it permanent, he destroys the last crystal, and the mode is effectively made useless without a power source. This was apparently an American invention, and it's gone for the rest of the series, so money well spent. As Scrozzle completes the combined power-up from the data chips, Vargoyle, mentioned a couple of times now, finally shows up and demands the return of the Fury Cells. It turns out Vargoyle was actually one of Scrozzle's early creations who turned against him, empowered by the Fury Cells beyond measure. Evox sees this as an opportunity, offering Vargoyle the chance to have the data chip upgrade if he can prove himself. You promised those powers would go to one of us. I promise to reward my strongest servant, and that is not you. He's got a point. Blaze barely did anything to earn the chips, and all of Roxy's plans failed miserably. Vargoyle tricks the rangers into thinking he's pathetic and weak, so that one by one they split off from fighting him to deal with a Giga Drone until he's alone with Steel. It's only thanks to Nate's timely arrival that Steel isn't killed in the ensuing fight, and he still manages to get away with a ton of Morphex, proving to Evox that he should get the data chip upgrade. Vargoyle steals an idea from the Avatars for a device that will allow Evox to get all the Morphex he needs, much to their outrage, but Evox doesn't really care. If Vargoyle's smart enough to steal your plan, then he's smart enough to carry it out. Vargoyle's plan is revealed in the episode Rewriting History, and it's a pretty good one. The device he stole from the Avatars can rewrite memories. Attaching it to the local news broadcasting station, everyone in Coral Harbor's memory is altered. They no longer recall Evox and think that Blaze and Roxy became the Red and Yellow Rangers, allowing them free access to Grid Force and the regular Rangers to revert back to who they were at the start of the season. Honestly, my only complaint about this is that the plan is outlined immediately for the audience, when I think it would have been better to let us enter into it in media res, with the audience not knowing what's happening, and we follow our heroes figuring it out themselves. The only one unaffected is Steel, who quickly deduces what's happened, though no one remembers him either, because of course events played out differently in their memories. He's able to recruit Devin and convince him that something's up, since he still has the cheetah DNA that grants him super speed. Inside the Grid Battle Force HQ, the Avatars obtain the Mega Teleporters, the devices used to originally send them and Evox into the Cyber Dimension. Roxy takes a moment to go back to the stasis chambers holding the Avatars' human bodies, and implants a thumb drive in the system, saying it's for later. Devin and Steel quickly locate the memory-altering device, which is guarded by a force field and an electrically charged tower. Devin is sent off to disable power while Steel climbs the tower despite getting electrocuted the whole way up, managing to destroy the device. Devin is intercepted by Vargoyle, who needs more Morphex to use the copied beast powers, but Scrozzle and the Avatars elect not to send it, wanting him to be destroyed. And thus Vargoyle is destroyed, but Evox now has the Mega Teleporters, and they've done something to Roxy's stasis pod. This brings us to Target Tower, which begins with Roxy's stasis pod beginning to malfunction. If she doesn't get her mind restored, her body will die. I'd ask why they didn't do this to Blazes as well, but let's face it, dude was already a douche. If he gets restored, he'll probably just join evil anyway. The Rangers soon find the Mega Transporters on Earth, which were going to be set up around one of the Morphex Towers to bring it to Evox. They retrieve them them, and Ravi starts to drive them back to HQ, but the Roxy Avatar shows up to distract him and keep him from taking them away. In the ensuing fight, he repeatedly blasts her. But hey, she's tough, I'm sure she'll be fine. 
Unfortunately, of course, Blaze is able to retrieve the teleporters and starts setting them up. However, what twists the knife is that when Ravi returns to base, Roxy still hasn't awakened, and Shaw gives him a thorough chewing out for disobeying orders and putting the entire city at risk, though she at least does say sorry about Roxy. Betty and Ben manage to get a hold of one of the teleporters to bring back to base, Mayor Daniels coming in to help as well, after scolding Devin for perceived cowardice in another fight when he doesn't realize he's the Red Ranger. Unfortunately, Blaze is able to retrieve it and put it into position, activating it and stealing the tower, along with a captured Devin. What's more, Mayor Daniels spotted Devin demorph. Back at HQ, Nate's plan is to rebuild the Cybergate and use it to teleport to the Cyber Dimension, hoping that storming Evox's base will allow them to stop him and rescue Devon. However, there's also some good news, bad news to make things better and worse. Roxy wakes up, but she reveals that Scrozzle learned how to build a robot body for Evox, which they'll be transferring him into, along with all the Morphex gathered from the tower. Leading us into our Season 1 finale, Evox Upgraded. Mayor Daniels is pissed that he was never informed that his son was put in danger like this, but his fury is quickly cooled by the reveal that Shaw's own son is a ranger too, so she knows full well what it's like to send your child into harm's way. The Cybergate is restored, but the portal is unstable, meaning it's too risky to send someone in until they have proper coordinates. As such, Mayor Daniels quickly grabs the beacon and heads in himself. And the portal overloads and shuts down. Typical politician, rushing in and doing something stupid before the scientists are ready. Even with the coordinates, they realize that they need something new and powerful to take on Evox, and fortunately, Nate has something just for that. The Ultrazord configuration. Mayor Daniels manages to free his son and get him away while the Ultrazord is formed and deployed into the Cyber Dimension. The formation sequence is short, but given a lot of grandeur. I don't think the Ultrazord itself is all that great looking, but points for trying to show off how cool and important this is. Naturally, a big ass robot gets the attention of the villains and they unleash an army of Giga Drones to confront them. Still, you don't call something an Ultrazord if it's a pushover, so it makes short work of the first wave. Devin and his dad reconcile and head off to try to get the ranger's attention, or at least get to the Cybergate. Evox's body is completed, and a single blast from him splits apart the Ultrazord and heavily damages the individual Zords. Our heroes are reunited. Couldn't have done it without you, Mr. Mayor. But now, we're in a tight spot. Damn. We're in a tight spot. Evox attacks and once again a single blast kicks their asses, demorphing them. He grows giant sized and prepares to leave, but the rangers quickly make plans. The Red Ranger's Zord is still functional and Morphex energy is highly explosive, so Devon can use it to destroy the tower and hopefully take Evox along with it. The other rangers will take out the teleportation capabilities of Evox's base to keep him from escaping. Devon heads into the tower to destroy it from underneath, but Blaze is waiting for him and a Zord constructed for him. Of course, Devon destroys it and the Blaze avatar along with it. Scrozzle teleports away as Evox begins traveling to Earth, but Nate is able to access the teleportation system and reverses it. As the tower explodes, Evox seems to turn purple as our heroes return through the Cybergate, Devon arriving at the last second. The real Blaze soon awakens, our heroes are all given medals for saving the world, some comic relief from Betty and Ben, and we'll never see Evox again. Right, Mayor Daniels? Two on special occasions, and this is a pretty special occasion. Before the next season, which for the first time in many years is not labeled as Super, it's just season two of Beast Morphers, we of course have our season requisite holiday clip shows. Except for this time around, we only have a pair of them, not one for the second season as well that takes place after the finale or anything. The Halloween one was Hypnotic Halloween. So, I found us a film to watch on this weird streaming service. Oh no, they've discovered Quibi! Scrozzle uses a hypnotic video to make four of the rangers think they are their Halloween costumes and Ravi apparently thinks that Sherlock Holmes went around everywhere just examining everything with a magnifying glass. Devin has to get them to remember who they are through the context of their costumes and clips. With Zoe as a Viking, they need to dress up as Vikings. I say dress up as Kung Fury. I'm a cop from the future. I was sent back in time to kill Hitler. For Nate and Steel, they're Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monsters, so... I'm Dr. Reeves. We heard that you and your creation have not been getting along. I never thought of that before. Maybe the Frankensteins just needed some therapy. The holiday clip show is Scrozzle's Revenge, which of course takes place after the finale. The first clips are Steel and the Beast Bots basically going, Hey, the Ranger's parents are great. Let's show some clips of that. Scrozzle wants to destroy Christmas as revenge for the destruction of the Cyber Dimension. He sucks them into ornaments, and the Beast Bots have to fight a Gigatron without the others, with some clips to encourage them. 
Grossel is seemingly destroyed, and everyone goes to the North Pole with Santa, because, as we've established, Santa is very real in the Power Rangers universe, and he's got a personal hotline to the Rangers. It's still the same actor after all these years, wow. There's job security for you. But let's get going with Season 2, beginning with Believe It or Not. Blaze and Devon are now good friends in the intermediate time between seasons, and the success of the Morphex Towers in Coral Harbor has gotten the technology to start spreading throughout the world. Roxy and Ravi are able to date again, since she's not really a ranger anymore, and the team now just does regular training instead of ongoing fighting. Steel, in the meantime, has been looking for Pepe Sylvia, it would seem. Actually, he thinks that Evox is still alive, based on monster sightings like... Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. <sighs> You've been talking to that deranged school teacher from City Town, haven't you? Oh, I'm sorry, Harwood County. Because, you know, it's normal and not confusing at all to name a city county. Anyway, he does have some actual strange things as evidence. Leaks in Morphex towers that have been cleaned up, yet no cleaning crews were assigned. Devin doesn't buy it because his father has been handling all this stuff. Steel brings the rangers out to the woods, supposedly to do some jogging and training, but of course it was to hunt for what he thinks is Scrozzel. I found it online, so it must be true! God, this poor innocent cyborg is gonna find some dark corners of the web someday, and it's gonna break my heart when he does. Since the others disbelieve him, Steel walks off to find evidence. Feeling bad, they go after him, and discover that Scrozzel is indeed alive and ordering Tronix to load more effects into a truck, claiming that Evox is also still alive. The theme song happens at the nine minute mark for this one, by the way, almost halfway through. Just... If you're gonna put it that far in, why even have the theme song? After a fight with a Giga Drone, they scan the Cyber Dimension, probably thanks to the Cybergate, but can't find any evidence of Evox there. As such, they can't even be sure of where the Giga Drone came from or where Evox is hiding. In the next episode, we see that they're operating out of some other dimension full of ice crystals. Evox still has his robot body, but it's somehow merged with Mayor Daniels, so like a few villains before him, he can transform between them, though he's in the driver's seat. Scrozzle warns that if he runs out of Morphex, he could transform in public. Though what's more, the human body is corrupting his virus, whatever the hell that means. Oh, and for some reason they shoot the scene revealing this as if it was a big surprise that it's Mayor Daniels, despite the fact that we saw at the last season the whole purple energy thing on him. Since Evox wants new generals, and they have the actors anyway, Scrozzle takes samples of Blaze and Roxy's DNA and, like with Evox, uses robotic base forms to build new evil clones of the two, having also stored memory banks up of the Avatar versions as well. So, basically, now they're Terminator versions of the two. I destroyed you, Avatar! Wrong again, lover boy. That was the old Roxy. My purple hair extensions give me new powers! They can also still morph, though their corrupted ranger forms have also changed, particularly Blaze's. The two are also now functionally immortal, their minds getting downloaded to new robot bodies if they get destroyed. So now they really can just say to the rangers whenever they see them, I'll be back. Drawing inspiration from a monster that grows more powerful by absorbing technology, the rangers find a way to convert their beast bots into armor that upgrades the rangers, basically creating an upgraded mode for the main three. Beast X mode. It's just some neat light armor again, and like the Fury mode, the less is more attitude with the designs really works well. Nate gets temporarily kidnapped by Evox in The Blame Game to complete the programming for a secret project for Evox, a malware that we see implemented in the next episode, Beast King Rampage. The military have been secretly building their own Zord, the Beast X King Zord. With the Rangers busy defending Coral Harbor, the network of Morphex Towers needs other forms of ongoing defense. The project was spearheaded by the mayor, and a girl named Megan, who had appeared in the previously mentioned Nate and Zoe relationship episode, which has not gotten a mention since then, I should note. She had attempted to blackmail Zoe into getting a position as Nate's assistant, then tried to blame him for a weapons malfunction that she caused that almost killed Ben and Betty so that she could get his job. Naturally, no one is happy to see her, and she seems truly apologetic for what she did, and demonstrates the Zord she designed. Using the malware program, Evox takes control of it, the real plan the whole time. With her help, and a big nerf bow and arrow, they're able to regain control of the Beast X King. They hand the thing over to the Rangers afterwards, which doesn't seem to really address the legit point that the military had about being able to help more than just one city, but whatever. In Secret Struggle, we finally revisit the Nate and Zoe relationship, where Steel learns of it and is confused why it's forbidden. What could possibly be the harm in dating? 
Who knows? Well, there are a few reasons for it, especially since this is essentially a military organization. Normally this sort of thing would be a matter of dating someone of a lower or higher rank within the same command structure, because it's a power imbalance that can cause potential issues. In the case of the two rangers, they're actively on the field together in situations where one or the other is in danger. We saw what happened with Ravi when he saw an opportunity to save Roxy's life. The tower got stolen because someone put the life of the person they love above the needs and welfare of the city and the planet. There could be a situation where a critical choice has to be made, but they're more worried about their significant other instead of the mission. Now, there are arguments to be made in response, like how, by that logic, Logic, no one on the team should be friends, because they'll place the life of a friend above the life of someone else. But it's a legitimate concern. I do like the double meaning of the title of this episode. On one hand, it's about the two rangers wanting to date, but can't. But on the other, it's about Evox being closely watched by the rangers and needing a resupply of Morphex to maintain his cover when they think Evox is trying to kidnap the mayor. The two admit their feelings to Shaw when security footage shows them about to kiss on their watching of the mayor, but the rest of the team thinks the rule is ridiculous. What use is a rule if all it does is make good people unhappy? Well, arguably, you just saw what happened. They were so engrossed with each other that they didn't notice the mayor slipping away to try to get some Morphex. Now, it could be argued that if they were allowed to be in a relationship to begin with, the familiarity would cause the passion to die down enough that they wouldn't have felt the urge to give into those feelings Lady and the Tramp style as what happened. Like I said, much as I personally think they should be allowed to be together, I'm a sucker for romance, there is an argument for why this shouldn't be a thing. Hell, here's another one. What happens if the two break up and it's a messy breakup at that? That. It can screw with the team dynamics and affect more than just them. Or what happens if there's an affair while they're still technically together? When you order a guy to go fight, the guy can't think it's because you're sleeping with his wife. Ultimately, Shaw decides to remove the rule after seeing how well the two work together. And Mayor Daniels gets exposed as Evox, who escapes. In the following episode of the Evox Snare, we actually see some good judgment. Knowing now that the mayor was Evox, they realize that the computer network linking the Morphex towers, and the towers themselves, are potentially compromised. So all the network will be shut down and all the energy sent back into the morphing grid until the situation with Evox can be resolved. What's more, the human Human DNA corrupting the virus part of him means that he needs incredible amounts of Morphex to stay alive, so they're basically cutting off his food supply while preparing a trap should he show up in person to try to get what's left. Once he does, they hope to capture him with a freezing arrow. Cool party! And thanks to my genius brother, it's hard as diamond. No way out! Yeah, give it Peter Capaldi a few billion years in a time loop, and we'll see about that. Devin, though, worried that he could be trapped indefinitely without any plan on how to separate the two, objects to the plan and tries to research a way to retrieve him. Fortunately, his research comes up with something... interesting. It was a Black Ranger once. He was slowly turning into an evil cyborg. Their lead scientist found a way to stop the process. Her name was Dr. K. He's tried to contact the RPM universe, but hasn't been able to get an answer from them. Remember, as established last time, Wes has been handing out dimension hopping tech to other rangers. Wes's dimension hopping tech is not just a matter of coming to the aid of other rangers, but informing them of other threats in their respective universes. Anyway, they lay a secondary trap for Evox after his forces fail to take a tanker full of Morphex, luring him out to what looks like a full, unguarded tower. However, Devon returns to base upon getting a response. What happened to Ranger Black is very different to what's happened to your father. I'm sorry, but none of my technology can help you. However, she does point him in the direction of the Dino Charge universe, and how they were able to split Xenowing and Doomwing. And hey, they already had those props from a few years ago, so might as well reuse them. The devices used there do exist in this universe. It seems that a lot of the Ranger technology Grid Battle Force has is based off of Ranger tech given to them from other universes. Devin looks for the split emitters. We need to find something called split emitters. What do they look like? No idea. Maybe you could look it up in a database or something? I've got to imagine all the stuff you have in here is cataloged. Anyway, after some neat little fan service bits, one person on Twitter asked how the hell they got Mystic Morphers on there, though I suppose Udana could have given them, like, a blank wand for the purposes of this. They find the split emitters. Over the tower, Evox appears and they take the shot. You think this little stick is going to stop me? 
doesn't work on a cord hearted. Devin arrives and they use the split emitters, separating Evox and his dad. However, the episode ends on a slightly stupid note, as they elect to reactivate the towers now after Evox escapes, instead of just waiting it out for him to starve. Mayor Daniels doesn't recall what happened after the Cybergate, so sadly they don't know what Evox's plans are. Though they did find trace amounts of the Evox virus in the computer network that they've purged. We're not done with that vault yet either. In the next episode, Intruder Alert, Grid Battleforce gets a message from Deep Space that an alien criminal, Ryjack, is coming to steal valuable technology from them, and Shaw wants to assign extra security to it to make sure the Ranger tech in there isn't taken. They get a report of alien biosigns taking some Morphex, but when they intercept the Silver Being, it can't communicate with them. Damn VR troopers stealing our Morphex. Look, we had a chance to make you canon to Power Rangers years ago and we botched it. Nobody cares anymore. They think it's Ryjack, and he runs off when he fails to retrieve the device he was charging. By the way, this suit is from Metal Heroes, another tokusatsu series in Japan. Sheriff Skyfire from last season was also a metal hero. I didn't mention him because his appearance was in a terrible filler episode. Ryjack heads to the dimension Evox is based out of to ask for help in stealing the ranger weapons. They accept in exchange for Morphex and destroying the rangers, and he shows off one of his nifty trinkets, a device that can reanimate dead material into a robotic servant. In this case, restoring Vargoyle to life. Also, Ryjack is from Space Australia. Great Evox, I'm humbled to make your acquaintance. They call me Ryjack. So, it's like Australia in spice. The Rangers capture the Silver Warrior when he breaks into the vault to retrieve the device he left behind, but soon encounter the real Ryjack, who decides to resurrect some old friends. We at Hasbro would like to remind you all that we're selling toys of these now in the Lightning Collection. Yeah, Ryjax uses Putties and Vivax as his personal minions for his remaining appearances, reasoning how they fought the Rangers for years, apparently forgetting the part where they also got their asses kicked by Rangers for years. Ravi and Zoe get infected with some kind of alien virus, and with no other choice in how to help them, they talk to the Silver Being, finally giving him the device which recharges him and allows him to use a translator to speak. He says he's Captain Chaku from the G5 Galaxy Police Force hunting for Ryjack. He's able to heal the two rangers, and in the ensuing fight, Vargoyle is destroyed. Again. In the next episode, we learn Chaku has a daughter that he'd love to go home to, but is worried about returning because the Galaxy Police turned him into a cyborg. So he is pretty much Robocop at this point. I serve the greater good now. The greater good. Evox is pretty happy to use Ryjack for his own purposes, planning to steal his collection of weapons once he's destroyed. Scrozzle steals his reanimation device when he's separated from it as the Rangers destroy Ryjack with their Zords. Chaku was invited to stay even after Ryjack was defeated, so he readies himself for the position. You don't seem too excited about joining us, Chaku. I'm pleased to serve the greater good. The greater good. Shut it! Using the technology that gave the Rangers their powers, they're able to restore Chaku back to being fully human. With Ryjack destroyed, both the Rangers and Evox's forces begin searching for Ryjack's ship in Finder's Keepers. Zoe locates it, but it seems he was the paranoid sort, so when she tries to enter the ship, it self-destructs. Terminator, Blaze, and Roxy are sent in with the reanimation device to try to retrieve any relics they can from the ship and restore any warriors that they belong to. And indeed, they find the sword of Snide from Dino Charge, restoring him. However, it seems someone else decided to start going through the wreckage. Zoe, not recognizing them, finds one of the compliance collars Ryjack used and tosses it at them. Are you Keeper? That is correct. I came to retrieve the relics that Ryjack stole. Ah, oh, great. Now the space-time continuum in your reality is gonna start circling the drain any second now. Keeper gets taken by some Vivax, and who should show up to help through a dimensional portal? The Dino Charge Rangers! With the Rangers distracted, the villains are able to get away with Keeper. With the Compliance Collar, he's forced to tell them all he knows about the Rangers. Back with our heroes, Zoe accepts responsibility for screwing all this up, but the teams are dedicated to finding and retrieving Keeper. Also, for some reason, only Guy Dino Charge Rangers showed up. Don't know what's up with that. 
Evox suggests that taking the Energems from the Dino Charge Rangers would get them all the power they need. They send a message to the Rangers saying they'll give up Keeper for the collection of villain weapons they took from the wreckage. At the meeting, the villains of course take the weapons and leave Snide behind to fight the Ten Rangers with no intention of handing over Keeper. We've defeated Snide once and we'll do it again! Does Snide even know about that? The timeline has been altered multiple times now. The team separate as a Giga Drone is sent, the Dino Charge Rangers calling in Shelby and Riley to help. Back with the villains, seeing how Snide is doing against the Rangers, they reanimate Sledge and his crew to try to take the Energems. But we destroy you! Twice! Probably more than that, given how the space-time continuum is choking on its own blood at this point in your universe. The Dino Charge Rangers are forced back, but the Beast Morphers come in to rejoin the action. They get Keeper out of there too, to finally remove the collar. The Dino Charge Rangers can't stick around because of their own universe's responsibilities and return to it. Finders Keepers is a weird team up. It's not terrible, but it is very fast paced and there's not really much room for character stuff. While the two ranger teams fight side by side a couple times, it doesn't really feel as cool as it should be since most of that action is against foot soldiers. It's also kind of weird that Dino Charge is the one that gets the first real team up instead of Ninja Steel, since we already had some focus on Dino Charge last season. And to be fair, I like Dino Charge. It's just odd that they're the ones that get the focus first. Maybe it's because of the decision to have Sledge and company brought back to work with Evox? Anyway, we continue on with Making Bad, as the villains decide to resurrect more villains for Evox's little army. Scrozzle points out that the villains being brought back... Well, they did get their asses kicked already, so maybe there's room for improvement with the resurrection process to make them more powerful. Scrozzle wants to bring back Korag from Mystic Force next, with some actual voice reprisal for Jeff Dolan, his actor in Mystic Force, over the footage. But Roxy points out, thanks to some clips from the season, that Korag was actually Leonbo, a good guy, so that plan is dumb. Her suggestion? Astronema! Yeah, that gets shot down pretty quickly. The episode is actually kind of a clever stealth clip show, the villains in this case watching footage of old seasons to get ideas for who to resurrect. And shock of all shocks, they used my idea of watching footage from non-widescreen seasons on a monitor to hide that detail. Scrazzle brings up Lord Zed since they do have his staff. God, with our luck they'd bring back Thrax. Annoyingly though, his footage is dubbed over. In fact, that's the case for most of the footage shown. According to Kyle Higgins, the writer of a good chunk of the critically acclaimed Boom Studios Power Rangers comics, including Shattered Grid, when he made a short promoting the comic and tried to use audio from the original show, it seems that the masters didn't have an isolated dialogue-only track, so if the producers of Beast Morphers did have masters to use, they would require dubbing to remove the music, or at least extensive amount of work for a few lines. And even more tragically, Robert Axelrod had passed away in 2019, so even if they did bring Zed back, he wouldn't be able to voice the character again. Still, the logic in-universe for not bringing him back is pretty good. He'd betray Evox immediately. Then again, so would most of the villains. Also, he technically turned good too, thanks to the Z-Wave. They do the same dubbing for Rita, and man, at least they tried to get someone who sounded like Zed. The person they got to do the voice for Rita is Susan Brady, who did the Mystic Mother in Mystic Force, aka Good Rita. Which is a neat detail, but she sounds nothing like Rita in either appearance, so there you go. It goes on like that for the villains. Stock footage, bad dubbing, Sledge's crew, including Poissandra, are destroyed by the Rangers, and Evox finally makes a decision on who to resurrect and enhance. I have returned! So, Kerrigan Mine wasn't available to return to the voice, huh? That's a shame. Or maybe it was a union thing, who the hell knows with Power Rangers at this point. When Sledge is unimpressed by Goldar, Evox tells Goldar to destroy him, which he does so. Really dumb move on Evox's part, since Sledge is still hella strong, and they broke the reanimation device making the enhanced Goldar. This leads us into our next crossover episode, Grid Connection. Keeper returns. I've come to warn you that I've had a vision. You... have those? Is that normal for your species? I feel like psychic premonitions would have been really helpful in your season. Anyway, the Vision saw the team defeated. He couldn't tell which rangers were involved in the battle. But I saw you, Devon. You were hit by a meteor. Nothing more disappointing than discovering that you meet your ultimate end because of a rock. Devin is skeptical of the Vision and heads off to participate in a video game tournament, but he and Cruz get lost on the way. And then a meteor hits Devin! 
Score one for E.T. Back at HQ, they receive a distress call from the Dino Charge Rangers, who are under attack by Vivax. He opens up a dimensional portal for the Beast Morphers to come help, and indeed, it's Evox's forces led by Goldar and Snide going after the Energems. Now I, Goldar Maximus, have the blue Energem! Oh, I'm sorry, it's Goldar Maximus. It makes a huge difference. As Devin returns to HQ, apparently none the worse for wear for getting hit by a friggin' meteor, they get a distress call from the other rangers saying their morphers have been destroyed. He wants to go help, but as Shaw points out, one more ranger isn't gonna make a difference. Remembering what Keeper said about the morphing grid connecting all rangers together, Devin elects to head into the energy flow of the grid and send out a distress call through it. Get any rangers who are willing to come to the aid of his team and the Dino Charge rangers. Normally, the energy would kill him if he walked directly into it, but the meteor that hit him is made of a special material that can repel energy. Huh, I guess when the series says, may the power protect you, what they really mean is, may this random meteor protect you because the morphin grid will frickin' tear you apart. The call goes out, but most amazingly, the meteor collapses, revealing the Tyrannosaurus coin. And what a dink for who steps through a dimensional portal next. Yep, Jason is back yet again, and I guess we just kind of forgot that he had his powers again in Forever Red. Or maybe they got busted again. It's been a few years, after all. Back on the Dino Charge Earth, the villains are trying to create dinosaur zords based off of information Keeper gave them under mind control. Jason and Devin arrive to help the others, only Riley and Shelby still having their powers and remaining morphed because... Well, there's some speculation there. While the two came back to do voiceover for the characters, some have argued, based off of deleted tweets, that they actually hated their time on the show. It could also be a union thing, like with voice actors, and it could also just very well be their actors were busy and didn't want to fly out to New Zealand for filming. Any of them is really a possibility. The idea of working on Power Rangers might be a dream to some, but the actual realities of filming can be awful. Devin brings new morphers for his team, as well as Dino Chargers filled with Morphex to allow the Dino Charge Rangers to morph without the Energems. They split up, with the Dino Rangers going to attack the villains directly, while the others ambush from behind. So you're Goldar Maximus, huh? I hope you're a lot tougher than the last one we defeated. I mean... Technically, you guys never defeated him. He was turned to dust by the Z-Wave. Goldar thinks they'll be fine since he has an army on his side. But Jason reveals that he wasn't the only one who answered Devin's call. And I guess we'll just pretend the other Mighty Morphin Rangers have Master Morphers or something. Rangers forever! Defenders together! I think this is the first time since Overdrive we've had multicolored explosions behind the team-up. Even Dimensions in Danger only had a regular explosion. And this only is happening because it's Sentai footage. While an awesome fight scene ensues there that results in Snide destroyed, the Beast Morphers run into Evox and Scrozzle as they complete their Zord, referring to it as the Chimera Zord. Goldar gets destroyed by a big-ass gun combined from the three dinosaur team's individual weapons. However, the Chimera Zord is launched, and it's... Whatever the hell this thing is. Man, I thought Serpent Terror was bad, but that Zord has six heads! Damn. We're in a tight spot. The three teams summon their Megazords. Again, not sure how the original Megazord is here, but hey, Tommy fixed the Falcon Zord last season. Then again, that Zord was technically never destroyed, just the Power Coins were. And I suppose that if the Zords were tied to the Power Coins, then the original Megazord could come back too. Devin summons the Beast X King Zord, and it's able to combine with the Dino Charge Megazord. So all the teams present are able to blast the Chimera Zord to hell. Everyone says their farewells. Today, Tomorrow or decades from now, there will always be rangers like you. Grid Connection is another odd duck to be sure. It's basically part two of Finders Keepers, even though Making Bad is also in between them, and yet it brings in characters completely unrelated to the Dino Charge team up. And this is one of those cases where it's Sentai influencing things because of the footage they had. See, one of the problems with adapting seasons out of order is that if you want to use Sentai footage for the team ups, you're limited by what teams they did go to. Go Busters came before Cure Uger, the Sentai Dino Charges based on, so footage here is from their team up. 
Now, take what I say here with a grain of salt, since, like, a lot of Sentai information, this comes secondhand, but apparently Go Busters was not successful in Japan. So they got kind of shoved aside in their team-up with Kyoryuger, making it more a Dino Sentai reunion with Zhu Ranger and Abba Ranger instead. And hey, this stuff's expensive, so I'm not surprised they decided to adapt a team-up where they could at least fit in plenty more Sentai footage while still trying to make it special, especially with bringing back Austin St. John as Jason. And in a lot of cases, some actors don't want to come back, or there would be no reason to bring them back for what is little more than a cameo. We saw with the legendary battle how hollow and expensive it was for a bunch of actors brought around who didn't do anything. Of course, as I've said, the best team-ups are the ones that advance the characters of the previous team or have some resolution on old matters, so this team-up is just okay and fun. I suppose you could argue it's a final battle between Goldar and Jason, like they had a few times in the original Mighty Morphin, but they don't really have some big personal one-on-one -on -one fight between them or anything. But yeah, the poor Beast Morphers team barely gets to do anything with the others, which is further disappointing. Here's what I've realized about the final fourth of Beast Morphers, though. Especially with the increasing amount of references to past teams, old villains, fun team-ups and cameos, and guest stars of past rangers. It's Megaforce calling a do-over. The Morphin Grid is a prominent part of the series, series as opposed to never being mentioned at all. Cameos from across the franchise and referencing specific events from old shows. Being willing to show footage of the old seasons and be clever about how it's utilized. Fan service shots and characters being just as excited as the audience about seeing this fan service, like the vault full of ranger tech. The Mighty Morphin team is given special reverence even if it's not explicitly called out for it. And even this team up features representatives from every era of the show. Saban, Disney, Neo Saban, and Hasbro. We're not even done with those references after this. And this wasn't a big anniversary year either. Beast Morphers second season, where all this happens, was the 27th anniversary. Not a big, round, important number like 25th or 30th or something, but they cram a lot in. It's the kind of stuff we wish we got out of Megaforce. Sure, it's by no means perfect. In fact, apparently a big complaint among fans was that the show at this point was using fan service stuff like this as a crutch, unable to do its own ideas and just constantly shoving in references to try to appease the older fan base. I disagree, though. I certainly understand the opinion. It's a big problem I have with modern Star Trek at the time of this video's release. It feels like it can't go a single episode in any of its shows without slipping in references to older, better better shows, while not having as much substance and meaning, not truly building off of what came before, but rather expecting fans to be pleased because, hey, we mentioned Robert April and Quark, and the original ideas they do have are... Dumb. But anyway, I feel the difference here is that Beast Morphers had 30 episodes before this to build its own thing, establish their own characters, see the inner workings and arcs of these people, their hopes and motivations and nuances. You could certainly argue to the quality of those elements, or whether they're just rehashing ideas from other series, but they were still doing their own thing before we got a lot of references in the final part of the show, and 90% of the first three quarters didn't have continuity porn. Hell, the first episode's mentioning of past villains just makes sense and acknowledges villains have a habit of trying to steal this stuff and we're trying not to have goldfish memory about it. After a few more character-based filler episodes where our Terminator, Roxy, and Blaze get mutated with DNA from other living things, including Roxy getting flower and dinosaur DNA inside of her, the series just loves spitting in the face of an angry god, doesn't it? The device that resurrects them is damaged beyond repair, meaning the next time they get blowed up, they're gone. The mutation gives Roxy the ability to grow giant-sized, as well as giving her talon boobs, and they finally destroy her. In the third to last episode, Crunch Time, Terminator Blaze finally impersonates the real Blaze, without giving it away right off the bat to the audience, and manipulates the team into trying to capture Evox and a new advanced Giga Drone he's built the Omega Drone, inside of their base. The fight inside ends up severely damaging the Zord Hangar, crews, and the Zords themselves. Still, Evox ends up captured in a force field. Earlier, though, Evox mentioned something... interesting. Those Grozzle 
I have a very dark past. <laughs> In our penultimate episode, Source Code, the Rangers try to eliminate the captured Evox. He's essentially a computer virus, so they're gonna shoot him with antivirus software bullets until he's dead. Okay, the explanation is a little better than that, but it's essentially what they're doing. However, while they're repeatedly shooting his body, his programming slips down through his foot into some cable under the cell, transferring himself into their computer systems. The Rangers have to go through every computer system to try to destroy the ones that have access to the morphing grid and the Morphex towers. Because I guess Shaw ordering all the dozens of people who work there to shut them down or destroy them would just be ridiculous. After all, none of them are main characters. They chase him through the base until he reaches the vault and pulls out a certain case, the one that contains the RPM morphers. He repairs himself with the Red Ranger morpher and finally reveals his backstory. As a young child, Nate experimented with the Ranger technology given to them and tried to find a new way to morph. I'm trying to power old Ranger morphers with Morphex and snake DNA. Nate mixed Morphex with old morpher technology and snake DNA. Okay, well, sometimes science is more art than science, Morty. A lot of people don't get that. Like, I can't be too mad because he was a child, but like, please walk me through the steps here, Nate. Walk me through why this made sense to you. But yeah, Nate's experiments worked briefly on one of the RPM morphers. The snake DNA becoming part of its program. I don't know how that works for a program, but whatever. And whatever was in the red morpher transferred into their systems. You're starting to put it together. I was vengeance. Best part of this reveal, Andrew Lang, the original voice actor for Vengex, was Evox's voice actor this whole time under a pseudonym. Although they don't give him the same voice filter, sadly. Some say this reveal feels tacked on because it happens right at the end, and that's certainly fair. But according to Lang, this was planned from the start. And when you think about it, the MO matches. Robots corrupting good people into his slaves, acting as a program that quickly infects other systems. His overall attitude was different than regular Vengex, but it could be argued he's been altered both from sharing a human form via Mayor Daniels, as well as the snake DNA that's somehow a part of his program now. And hey, even if this is tacked on at the end, this is still a million times more respectful a tribute to RPM than a frickin' car driving around not Corinth that the Rangers need to yell at until it it stops. Told you this was do-over, Megaforce. Anyway, he laid dormant in the grid battle force computers until the Morphex energy was charged up and ready so he could try to claim the morphing grid for himself. He probably wasn't able to infect defense systems computers like on the RPM Earth because of different technology, the fact that his program was diminished from having to fit in a morpher, and just trying to avoid detection. With the Vengex virus at full power again, he's able to walk through the Rangers, summon some additional Robotrons to assist, and easily escape the HQ. Nate blames himself for causing the return of Vengex, that it was just bits and pieces of him as Evox, but now he's unleashed something as devastating as that into their world. I released Vengex into our world. Everything bad that's happened to us is my fault. He's paralyzed with fear of making things worse. How fortunate then that there's someone who can relate to this problem, and dealt with the same problem. You must be Nate. I'm Dr. K. She convinces him to actually deal with the problem instead of sitting around feeling sorry for himself. And see, this is what I wanted! Showing off character growth! I freaking love Dr. K. The episode of RPM with her backstory might just be my favorite episode of all Power Rangers, and arguably one of, if not the darkest. So seeing her again, having overcome her own self-doubts and horror over what happened, inspiring one of the Beast Morphers cast to do the same? I love it. They start searching Vengex's source code, based on what was in the RPM morpher, to see if there's a weakness they can exploit. Meanwhile, Vengex plans to access the grid network connecting the Morphex towers, which will be his ticket into the morphing grid. He dispatches Terminator Blaze to go access the network, but he was really a distraction while Scrozzle is sent with a copy of the codes to do it himself. Dr. K and Nate create an antivirus program loaded into an arrow, a thing they've done more than once on this show, and test it on RoboBlaze, annihilating him. Dr. K heads back to Corinth and her universe to start searching for any trace of Vengex in their own systems. You have a beautiful world. Keep it safe. 
Boy, Morty, I really Cronenberg the world up, didn't I? We got a whole planet of Cronenbergs walking around down there, Morty. Unfortunately, the episode ends with the tower network activated by Scrozzle, leading us into our finale, Evox Unleashed. As the city is evacuated, energy beams from the towers across the world converge on the one in Coral Harbor. Evox has taken control of the Morphex tower network. In retrospect, probably should have kept it turned off until he was gone. Our bad. After the message goes out, the reporter, Zoe's mom, begs Shaw to let Zoe go with her, thinking she's still in the laundry department. I'm sorry, but your daughter is critical to our success. She's in laundry. Hey, you never know. Unconventional thinking might be needed to stop Vengex. Pouring some bleach into his face and throwing a sheet over his head might just do the trick. Actually, Shaw gives the approval of Zoe to reveal herself to her mother. Heartfelt moments and all. You're the girl who solves big problems. Oddly, they continually refer to him as Evox, even though the reveal still happened and he's speaking in the Vengex voice. Maybe to try to make the title still make sense? Doesn't help with people referring to this as a tacked on thing. In any case, with the information he stole from their computers, he's immune to their weapons, but Devin has a plan to counter that advantage. Vengex appears and the Rangers head out to confront him armed with weapons from other ranger teams, which he is completely defenseless against. He summons Robotrons to deal with the rangers while he heads for the grid, entering the energy flow. Steel gets a hold of the discarded arrow and heads in, the rangers following after. We gotta go help Steel, come on! It was important to take off my helmet to tell you guys that! Steel enters the energy flow and stabs Vengex with it but he just absorbs it. He blasts Steel back, disintegrating him. His energy gets absorbed into the grid. The team returns to base, Devin announcing to everyone how Steel sacrificed himself to try to stop Vengex. He recommends everyone at Grid Battle Force evacuate, let the Power Rangers do this, but everyone there refuses to leave. We will defeat Evox, together, for Steel! For Steel! Damn right, Steel is awesome. The Morphex Tower suddenly transforms as the sky gets dark, Vengex forming into a giant robot. Damn, we're in a tight spot. Yeah, guys, I don't think dropping a building on him this time is gonna do any good. The Rangers head out to meet him in the Ultra Zord and get knocked down almost immediately. They realize that Vengex is actually completely repelled by humanity. He failed to get into Steel's body because of the human DNA present, and being inside Mayor Daniels screwed him up something good. If I can redirect more effects through our bodies, our attack will be infused with human DNA. Oh my god, are they literally going to, I am a man, punch him? And yep, the Morphex flows through them and into the Beast King X Megazord, which they use to punch him and then give every ounce of energy and Morphex they have, corrupting his systems and blowing him up. I figured it out. We just need to hit them really, really hard. The excess Morphex energy starts flowing into the grid, but a lot of it coalesces into steel, not just restoring him, but making him human. I'm human. And your voice isn't as good now. That's unfortunate. We cut to a year later, where Scrozzle is captured by Colonel Truman. Apparently, Scrozzle decided to hide in the RPM universe. Devin is now in charge of Grid Battle Force, while Commander Shaw was promoted to General, and they've decided to switch over to other alternate renewable energy sources like wind and solar instead of Morphex. Even though the use of Morphex energy wasn't really the problem, it was just, you know, the evil virus from a different dimension infused with snake DNA. The others are still around and still doing their thing as rangers. Steel became an actor with Blaze as his stunt double, and everyone gets together again to wish Steel a happy first birthday. Everyone dancing to... a bizarre song that had been in an earlier episode where Steel and Nate switched bodies for a day. There was a whole song and dance number that diegetically happened in universe. Like it was frickin' Xanadu. And that's how we end the series. Beast Morphers is a step up from Ninja Steel in a number of ways, but arguably it fits along similar lines of it in terms of the ratio of ongoing story episodes to filler episodes. However, what makes it superior to Ninja Steel in that regard is that all the Rangers get a lot more focus episodes and their own individual arcs, which we'll discuss at the end. Ninja Steel, by contrast, seemed to forget a couple of its characters beyond them being part of the group, and didn't have any interesting developments that really lasted for the rest of the show. As I said earlier, for some fans, the reveal of Evox is 
Vengex felt disappointing, not because we finally had resolution on the cliffhanger, but that it felt tacked on in the vain hope of making their finale more interesting because there wasn't enough from the villains to make it interesting otherwise. They're not entirely wrong in terms of it being interesting. The villains are pretty lackluster this season, despite having some very unique dynamics to them. In particular, the avatars of Roxy and Blaze, looking like people they knew, the potential for subterfuge and emotional manipulation. Unfortunately, that aspect was very underutilized. Not completely forgotten, there are a handful of episodes where they trick the rangers because of who they look like, but it felt like there should have been more to them, especially at the end where they just started mutating themselves to try to gain more power. How about a story where one or both of them starts realizing what they've done to themselves, that they're unrecognizable and don't want this anymore? realizing that their own desire for power is changing them in ways so they're not who they think they are, adding in further identity issues by virtue of them being evil clones of real people. You could have a tragedy there, with one just completely losing themselves until they're destroyed, and the other turns on Evox to try to stop it from happening to them, too. Maybe sacrificing themselves for the real one or something along those lines. I mentioned last time that the show struggles with non-suit actor villains, but this one had two that just didn't do much either. Scrozzle was boring, and for some bizarre reason, up until the finale, I kept forgetting his name. No, seriously, I kept having to look back at a wiki and my own script here to remember what the hell his name was. It's not like it isn't said enough. I could have made it a recurring gag, called him Scrabble or Scrotum or something, but... Honest to God, it didn't occur to me because I just legit had a struggle remembering what the hell his name was. He was very selfish and opportunistic, ready to play the avatars against each other and prop himself up to Evox. But that was it. Nothing more to it or to him. Evox is Vengex I pretty much discussed already at the reveal. He's not a great villain, though the reveal of him as Vengex does prop him up a bit. It's also a reveal that was sadly spoiled for me by fans who wanted to know how I felt about it. As a reminder, I do not watch the show as it airs anymore. I start watching it when I start working on the History of Power Rangers video for it. As in, a few days before that comes out. I won't start watching Dino Fury until 2023 and after the series is over. I'm just not as invested in the show anymore, and I lack the free time to do it for fun anyway. And let's face it, if a series is bad like it was with Samurai and Megaforce, it means I watched something painful twice. Fortunately, Beast Morphers is not a bad series. Knowing ahead of time that Evox's Vengex does paint some of his behavior in a slightly odd light, but as I said, changes to his program could mean changes to his attitude. Plus the simple fact that we're dealing with different writers than the ones who worked on RPM. Some writers can follow through on writing someone else's character and have it be exactly the same. Others will try to give their own spin on things. Ben and Betty are a bit controversial in the fandom. Them. Some being happy that their humor doesn't contain any flatulence jokes like Victor and Monty had. Though personally, despite that bit of gross-out humor, I think I preferred Victor and Monty as comic relief, honestly. The thing is that Ben and Betty bumble a bit and have bad things happen to them or slime gets thrown on them, but they're not malicious. They're honestly trying to help, and in their defense, they're not that stupid. They show multiple times to have electronic and mechanical aptitude and do successfully build things. It's just the items they create are a little too good, or they don't think to program limits on how they operate. And despite the occasional incompetence, they're quite brave and still happy to run into danger to help the rangers. They understand their duty and responsibility, it's just they're bumblers. Hell, they even teach a rock climbing class in one episode, and they were the ones who apparently caught Scrozzle in the RPM universe. And the rangers don't mock them for their bumbling, they never bully them. At worst, they get a good laugh at the situation, but only when Ben and Betty themselves seem okay with it. To the rangers, the two are not the butt of the joke. They're in on it. Unless they're not, in which case the team shows concern. Although sometimes their bumbling is just... bizarre. Like when a frickin' 12-year-old half their size bullies them, even though they are, at the very minimum, teenagers themselves. But that's also what kind of works against them for comic relief. Victor and Monty were arrogant pricks so full of themselves that they seemed to expect God to come down and applaud their magnificence. And as such, it was fun to see them get taken down a peg. Ben and Betty, you often just feel bad for them because some of the stuff that happens to them isn't their fault. It's kind of a punching down kind of thing. 
Zoe probably has the least amount of development, but part of that is because her overall arc was her relationship with Nate developing, them slowly getting together over the course of the show. That being said, once they were actually together, they didn't really do anything with it. Sure, they had more scenes together and basically were each other's confidants, especially Nate to Zoe, but it's not like there was a big plot where Nate had to choose trying to help Zoe over the needs of the city or something. It's almost like the rule forbidding romance really didn't have any bearing here. Zoe is an optimistic person and a problem solver, exemplified almost immediately by her. I can make a difference because I'm not afraid of big problems. I solve big problems. She was also very environmentally conscious, with some focus there in End of the Road, where she comes up with a city bicycle sharing program to reduce traffic congestion, instead of cutting down a park, and having previously worked at a marine center that she recommends to help sea life after a pollution spill. We never do learn why she was washed out of the academy. Maybe at the time she bit off more than she could chew, or she caused a problem that she couldn't solve? It's never said. While most of the time her mother, the reporter seen frequently in the show, is supportive of her, there's some minor conflict between the two during an episode when a news camera records the rangers morphing and she wants to show the footage, and like when this happened with Bulk and Skull not watching it beforehand, that episode is full of journalistic issues. But Zoe has to convince her not to. Devin has character development, it's just it pretty much stops when it hits the second season, since his major storyline throughout season one was getting his dad's respect. Mayor Daniels was constantly pushing him throughout season one to get a job somewhere, make something of his life, take responsibility, seeing his video game playing and karate training as mindless hobbies. And of course, the funny thing is that despite it looking like Devin would be the immature one, caring more about video games than anything else, it's immediately clear in the second episode that he takes the job very seriously. In fact, the whole big video game player thing is mostly sidelined until season two. After that, it's just concern about his dad when he learns his body is being controlled by Evox. The third to last episode has Blaze manipulating him by making him question his leadership skills, and it's pretty masterfully done, but on the other hand, it's the third to last episode. He's been leading the Rangers for a year or two now, and it seems like that's the sort of plot that should occur earlier on than right at the end. While there are certainly some parallels to be found with Dr. K, especially with the connection to Vengex at the end, Nate is much more emotionally developed and mature than she was. It helps that while his childhood was abnormal because he spent so much time in a lab, it's not that he was denied his childhood. He had people who wanted what was best for him and weren't lying to him for the sake of building weapons. He had emotional love and support, and arguably Commander Shaw acted as something of a mother figure, even if it's only really evident in the episode Digital Deception when she shows such a heavy concern for his well-being when he happened to be near a monster attack. But yeah, Nate's unusual childhood. His parents work overseas doing some kind of charity work or the like, traveling around a lot and not getting to see him very often. He developed a bit of a concern that his parents didn't love him, and you can see the panic on his face when they come to visit in season two, and they inform him they can only stay for a day. But you just got here. You're going to leave me again. His desire to have a family got sated when Steel was created, finally granting him a brother, for the good and bad parts of it that entailed. He has a catchphrase of phenomenal, which just feels like the show teasing us because he never says more phenomenal, which you'd think this of all series he would. On the subject of his brother, Steel is egotistical, but not arrogant, and it makes him very charming as he discusses how gorgeous and awesome he is. But despite that ego, he's endlessly positive about everything around him. The very experience of being alive is great for him, but his fondest wish is to be human. The opportunity, of course, comes when he and Nate switch bodies and leading to the song and dance sequence that a lot of people apparently love, but I have many issues with. But even then, the song is about how wonderful it is to be human. Also, he talks like either Duffman or Clive Sinclair, which is greatly amusing to me. I think his sacrifice, while still good, would have had more weight if it had come an episode or two earlier than the finale, giving the characters a chance to reflect on the fact that the one who loved life so much knew how important it was to protect it and give up his own for it, especially since a few times throughout the series he's been willing to sacrifice himself to save others. Ravi definitely gets the most development and the best arcs, tying in two related elements. The first, of course, being his his motivation to restore Roxy. We don't see it frequently, but his desire to save her is what drives him forward. 
And in his Focus episodes, we learn that he secretly likes to do art. In particular, pencil sketches and watercolors. He's pretty good, but he keeps it a secret from the team for a while because of his mother. Commander Shaw doesn't have a lot of development, being mostly just the authority who will occasionally disagree with a course of action. But one characteristic that she talks about in Ravi's episodes is a dislike for distractions away from being Rangers. Which is a bit odd, since the Rangers still clearly have normal lives and whatnot away from the base. In particular, she finds painting to be a waste of time and a distraction. Ravi admits later that she expects him to follow in her footsteps, so he became a stickler for the rules, doing his art in secret lest she find out and force him to stop. When he finally confesses, he gets her to see the error of her ways because it's what makes him happy, and even joins him in painting once she becomes a general at the end. He's also got one of the worst episodes of the series, when Roxy thinks he's cheating on her because of a misunderstanding, and it's the standard petty ball crap fighting instead of just frickin' explaining the situation properly. And on the subject of Roxy, while she and Blaze basically get no development and not many appearances once they're restored, Ravi gets one of the really good season one episodes when she tries to convince him that she's turning back to being good and needs his help to finish the process. One of the episodes that took advantage of the evil Roxy thing. Though a bit undermined since we know it's an evil plot right from the start. Still, Ravi-focused episodes were usually really good and led to some of the best drama for the character. If there's a unifying theme in Beast Morphers, it's family. All of the Rangers' individual plot threads have to do with their parents. Even Steel, since while he'll argue that he's Nate's brother, in the end he's more akin to his son. Even several plots of Ben and Betty deal with their father, and they themselves are siblings. It's all about living up to family expectations, wanting to be proud of that family, not wanting to disappoint them. There isn't really a mentor for this season. Each Ranger has their own parent that they want to please, who could arguably be their mentor or motivating influence. Even seemingly unrelated characters have something to do with family. Steel inspired to try to make people better through punishment upon seeing a father discipline his daughter for littering. A video game tournament where Devin's opponent needs money for her brother. Chaku fearing that he can't go home to his daughter. Roxy trying to get her aunt to see reason about a pollution spill her company caused. If Dominic Toretto was a Power Ranger, this is the season he'd be hanging out in. It doesn't have much to say about family, and sadly I feel like there could have been more emphasis on the idea of found family, especially in Nate's case, but I suppose it is good for kids to see all sorts of different familial relationships and how, in the end, family can and should love them above all else. And that's really all there is to say about this season, in my opinion. When the history of Power Rangers returns, it will be with an evolution revolution in Power Rangers Dino Fury. Well, you're full of surprises. Actually, I'm full of wires.